Take your copy of God's Word, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians in the New Testament. We're continuing this study through this little letter that the Apostle Paul wrote. Our series is entitled, Hope and Holiness During Hostile Times. If there was ever a time that we church needed to be able to bring, to live out holy lives and to bring hope to a world, this is the time that the world desperate, desperately needs it. God's Word, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're going to be this morning. As you're turning there, lately I have been really into spy movies. One of my favorites is the Mission Impossible series. Now y'all, y'all do it with me. The first service just totally did not do a good job, but y'all know the theme, right? Y'all you know the there you go. We need somebody to do the doodaloo. All right, anyway. Very good. Much better than the first service. All right. So that's, that's one, of my, one of my favorites. I've, obviously, the music we, uh, is catchy, and we know that. One, the main character is Ethan Hunt. Um, Ethan is a senior field operations agent for the Impossible Mission Force. And although... He has many skills. Ethan is a master of disguise. Some of y'all may remember from some of the earlier movies, uh, he had an uncanny ability in pretending to be another person than who he truly was. Being a fake is probably a good thing in the world of counterintelligence, unless you get caught, obviously. It's a, it's a good thing. But living a fake life as a follower of Christ, is problematic to say the least, whether you get caught or not. Pretending to be one thing when you really are something else brings shame to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I really believe what our world desperately needs is authenticity. To be men and women who are authentic, who who are the real deal. The Apostle Paul and his companions, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, were certainly authentic Christian leaders before the believers in Thessalonica. They were, they were the real deal in a world full of fakes. The question that I hope will resonate with you this morning as we walk through God's Word together is this. Are you authentic? Or are you masquerading as a believer? Are you the real deal in a world full of fakes? This morning we will learn that authentic Christian leaders will model genuine love and commitment before the people that they have been called to lead. If you would, stand with me in the reading of God's holy word this morning. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 beginning in verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Pray with me. Lord, again, we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the privilege we've had to sing praises to your name this morning. And now, God, as we walk through your word together, Father, teach us what it means to be authentic followers of Christ in a world that desperately needs to see authenticity. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. In our text this morning, the Apostle Paul really gives us four portraits of an authentic Christian leader. Now, listen, don't, some of you would say, well, pastor, I'm not a leader in the church. I'm more of a follower. And so what I would submit to you, though, is don't check out as we go through God's Word together this morning, because what we're going to see is that Paul and Silas and Timothy were modeling before these believers in Thessalonica what it means to be an authentic Christian leader so that the hope would be that they in turn would live authentic Christian lives. So this is truly a message for each and every one of us in in this room this morning. I want you to notice the first portrait with me of an authentic Christian leader. 
An authentic Christian leader will be a courageous messenger. An authentic Christian leader will be a courageous messenger. Notice what the text says. We read just a few minutes ago in verse 1. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of such conflict. There are really two schools of thought here, maybe possibly even a third school. Where is Paul coming from as he writes this, as he kind of begins the body of this letter here in chapter 2? Some say that Paul was probably responding to opponents who attacked the gospel message, but also attacked the gospel messengers, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, in an attempt to discredit Paul. So Paul is responding to that. Others suggest that Paul was giving the Thessalonian believers a model of behavior and lifestyle. I tend to lean a little bit more towards the second option based on the context. Remember, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 6, we studied last week. Notice what Paul said in verse 6 of chapter 1. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. And so it sounds as if Paul is trying to share with these believers, this is, this is what it looks like. This is what the authentic Christian life looks like. We are modeling before you how you are to behave, how you are to live as followers of Christ. So imitate us. Imitate Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Imitate, mimic us. Although it, a third option here could be that Paul was doing a little bit of both. He's defending the gospel message He's defending the gospel messengers, and at the same time, he's exhorting the church to imitate him. Notice in verse 1, Paul shares with the Thessalonian believers that he, Silas, and Timothy, their coming was not in vain. In other words, it was not a failure. Before coming to Thessalonica, Paul and Silas ministered in Philippi. You can read about that in Acts chapter 16. After healing a girl who had a spirit of divination, Paul and Silas were dragged into the marketplace, beaten with rods and thrown into prison. And so therefore, Paul says here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, But though we had suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God, even in the midst of much conflict." The idea here is this, their experiences in Philippi could have derailed them. It could have destroyed their confidence. However, Paul, Silas, and Timothy were able to declare the gospel with amazing courage despite strong opposition. It's safe to say that God himself gave them this supernatural courage. Let me share with you just a few quick thoughts of application. What does this mean for us this morning? First, spiritual leaders should be declaring the gospel. Spiritual leaders must be, should be declaring the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether they step into a pulpit, whatever they may be doing, teaching the word, they should be declaring the gospel. And by the way, by extension, you should be as well. We are modeling for you. This is what we do. We, we teach, we display, we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that ought to share with us this morning. It ought to remind us that we should expect gospel teaching and preaching from our preachers. We should never tweak the message of the gospel to make it more palatable to the listeners. That's ear tickling which is no gospel preaching at all. So spiritual leaders should declare the gospel. You should expect to hear the good news gospel of Jesus Christ when you come to hear God's word preached. Number two, declaring the gospel will not always be easy. It's the right thing to do. It's what we must do. We should come to expect and to hear the gospel anytime we gather. But we need to realize in the world in which we live, declaring the gospel will not always be easy. So in other words, that should remind us, church, that we must anticipate much difficulty. And I think Paul, Silas, and Timothy are a prime example of that. 
They went through difficulties in the first century as they taught the greatest message of hope ever given to mankind. It definitely came with some difficult trials along the way. So declaring the gospel will not always be easy. It was not easy for Paul, Silas, and Timothy. It will not always be easy for us, but it must be proclaimed. Which brings me to a third point. God will give you the boldness to declare the gospel. Depend upon him. In all areas of our life, we are, we are reminded in God's word that we must trust the Lord with all of our heart. Well, this is another reminder that we are to depend upon Him. We preach and we teach the gospel. We live out. We display the gospel before a watching world. Doesn't mean it's not going to come with some difficulties along the way, but we realize that God will give us the boldness necessary to share this gospel message. So declare it and depend upon Him. God gave Paul and Silas uncommon boldness to stand up in the synagogue in Thessalonica and preach the same message that had brought them persecution in Philippi. They didn't backpedal the message, however. They continued to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Their boldness, despite strong opposition, was even a sign that God was at work in his servants. And it was even more so proof of their genuineness and faithfulness that they continued to proclaim and display this gospel message. An authentic Christian leader and by extension, followers will be courageous messengers of the gospel. Number two, a second portrait that we see the Apostle Paul describe and model is this, that of a faithful steward. That, would have a, that of a faithful steward. Now this is some language that we need to make sure that we all comprehend and understand. Sometimes we can use terminology and maybe some people may not understand what we mean by that. So what is a steward? One pastor defined a steward this way. A steward is one who has been given the responsibility to manage for or care for someone or something. He's not the owner. He's the steward. The steward is simply the caretaker if you think about it, that's what God has done with us. We are stewards of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are stewards of the Word of God. We don't own it. Ultimately, God even manages it, but He allows us to to take this message and share it, to be a steward of this gospel message. Now, I want you to notice some things here. First, a faithful steward will consider how he or how she preaches and teaches. They will consider, give great consideration. Look at verse 3. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. Paul is speaking here of purity of content. So he's speaking about the message, but also he's speaking of purity of heart. Or in other words, their motives in preaching the gospel and displaying the gospel. He told the believers here in Thessalonica that the urgent message, the gospel message, did not spring forth from error, didn't spring forth from error. In other words, Paul's message was a message of absolute truth with no mixture of error, is what Paul's saying. But also, it was not a message of impurity, Paul says. In other words, Paul's motivation in declaring this message was clean. It it was not impure. And then thirdly, there was no attempt to deceive. Paul is saying here, his method was not to trick. It was not to manipulate. It was not to deceive. But instead, the apostle Paul's message and his delivery of it was straightforward. Very matter of fact. This should remind us, church family, that our preachers and our teachers should check their motives for preaching and teaching God's Word. You can have the right message, but have the wrong motives for preaching that message. Preachers should teach absolute truth and not in any way attempt to mislead or manipulate the congregation. We have to be careful for that. We don't want preachers that stand up and and use the pulpit as almost kind of a bully pulpit to try to manipulate or mislead the congregation. A faithful steward will consider how they preach, but secondly, a faithful steward will also consider who they please. 
who they please. Look at the text, verse 4. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, listen to this, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Verse 5, for we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed, God is witness, nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. In verse 4, Paul and Silas say, instead of, of how we could have, we spoke as men approved by God who were entrusted stewards, if you will, of the gospel. The word approved there was a New Testament word used to, in reference to metal purifying. It was a testing of the metals to prove their genuineness. One commentator says here that the implication is that Paul, Silas, and Timothy bore the approval and the commission of God because they had been proved through divine testing. God had stamped their lives as trustworthy because their faith had been proven genuine. But what does the word entrusted mean? Paul saw himself as a steward, entrusted by God to carry the gospel message to both lost men and lost women. And as a result, Paul said this, So we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our heart. So the entire focus of Paul's preaching ministry here was on plea, and not just his preaching ministry, but his ministry in general was on pleasing God alone. Why? Well, think about it. God alone is the one who examines our hearts, who tests our hearts. He alone is the one that we will stand before one day to give an account to. W.A. Criswell's great preacher at First Baptist Dallas for many years and he tells the story of a train master who was responsible for the smooth operation of a busy depot in the heart of a crowded city. A passerby commended him for his display of grace and tact as he juggled his many responsibilities including answering questions and giving directions and maintaining the smooth operation of the depot. The passerby asked him, how do you do it? With so many hurried people, disgruntled and angry, how do you maintain your composure? And the wise train master replied, why, it's not such a big deal. I do not have all these people to please. I only have to please just one man. He pointed to an officer and to a window on the second floor, and he said, my master sits in that office And it it is he alone that I have to please. Church, the Apostle Paul lived for an audience of one. Do you? Do you live for the praise of people? Or do you live for the praise of God? Are you yourself living for an audience of one? of one. A faithful steward will will consider who they please. Look at verse 5. He continues, for we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. What does Paul mean here when he speaks of flattering words? Flattery doesn't simply refer to saying nice things about people as we might presume. I think that's The given here, Paul's just talking about, we didn't come with you with flattering words or flowery words, talking about how great the church in Thessalonica or the believers in the church in Thessalonica are. Paul's speaking of this. It was the practice, saying flattering words was the practice of tailoring truth to fit popular opinion. Whatever the popular opinion was in that day or in this day, that's what the preacher would tailor his message to. And by the way, that's the complete opposite of what was given to Paul and his companions by God. Remember, he gave them boldness in declaring the message. So Paul will invoke God as his witness that he did not use such ungodly tactics before the believers in Thessalonica. Why? Because God only could fully know the motives behind Paul's actions. Paul's actions. 
He goes on to say in verse 6, Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. Paul's saying here, although we could have made demands as apostles of Christ, this, this would have been well within our rights as apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't seek glory or praise from people. One commentator said this, traveling philosophers and orators were common in the Roman Empire. They traveled from place to place, entertaining and seeking a personal following for fame and fortune. Paul and his companions had nothing in common with such men. Rather than seeking something for themselves, they delighted in giving freely to others. Remember, church, a steward is simply a caretaker. The steward manages something or someone that belongs to another. Church, the gospel message is God's message of hope to a hell-bound humanity. He is the owner. It belongs to Him. He purchased it with His own shed blood. Yet He has called you and He has called me to be good stewards of His gospel, of His gospel message. And so... The question for you this morning that I've been asking myself is, am I a good steward of this message that I have been entrusted with? An authentic Christian leader will be a faithful, faithful steward. Thirdly, an authentic Christian leader will be like a caring mother. Look at the text in verse 7. But we were gentle among you. He's saying we could have made demands, this is tied, it's a, it, the word but, there's strong contrast compared to what he was just saying at the end of verse 6. We could have made demands as apostles of Christ, but instead we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. And so what do we notice here? The language that Paul uses is really unique. First, believers must be gentle with others. We are to be gentle with others. Paul is, as we already mentioned, contrasting the demands that he and his companions could have made compared to how they actually responded to the believers in Thessalonica with gentleness. The New Testament word here for gentle can mean either gentle, can be translated either gentle or infant. The ESV and the NIV translations prefer the translation gentle. Older manuscripts prefer the word infant. Either way, the illustration here can't get lost. It's beautiful. There's hardly anything on God's green earth as gentle than a nursing mother taking care of her children. Don't forget also that gentleness is one of the nine fruit of the spirits that the Apostle Paul will talk about in Galatians chapter 5. This week I was just kind of scrolling through on Twitter and I read a tweet from a pastor who admitted that he was struggling as a leader during COVID-19. One of the first responses, and this really interested me, I started scrolling through because I wanted to see the various responses. The first response was from another believer. I think it, he may have been a pastor, but I don't know that to be true. But this is how this guy responded. <clears throat> he told this pastor who said he was struggling, Suck it up, buttercup. You've not been through what Jesus went through. Well, that's very true. <laughs> but that's not exactly what that brother needed in that moment. That was anything but a gentle response. Adrian Rogers once said, consider how gentle God is toward us. Can we just stop for a minute and just consider God's gentle spirit towards us? He is holy God, creator of all things, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and yet He is tender and merciful towards us. When we sin, what does He do? He gently convicts us, leading us back to Himself. When we struggle, He doesn't tell us to suck it up and be tougher. Rather, He gently comforts us when we're brokenhearted. What does He do? He, he brings us unto Himself. Just as God is gentle with us, we ought to be gentle toward others. 
One of the biggest hindrances, church, and one of the biggest roadblocks in our gospel witness today, I believe, is the lack of gentleness that is displayed by many believers, many followers of Christ. We should expect the lost world to be not gentle in their response to one another, but that should not be said of followers of Christ. Believers must be gentle with others, secondly. Believers must be affectionate with others. Look at the text in verse 8. So, being affectionately desirous of you, Paul says, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, not only did we want to give you this good news message, but we also wanted to share our own lives, our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. Paul and his companions are expressing a deep love and affection for these believers in Thessalonica. How did this love express itself? This great love led Paul and his companions to not only share the gospel, but to also share their lives. Think about it this way. To to Paul, love is always a verb. It's always doing for others or for the Lord. A few years ago, there was a book written by the author's name, Simon Sinek. He wrote a New York Times bestseller book. If, for all you leaders out there, maybe some of you have read it. If not, you may want to be one you check out. It's entitled, Leaders Eat Last. He got the title for the book from a Marine Corps general who said, Officers Eat Last. Sinek watched as the most junior Marines ate first while the most senior Marines took their place at the back of the line. What's symbolic in the chow hall is deadly serious on the battlefield. Great leaders sacrifice their own comforts for the good of those in their care. And what's true in the battlefield, guess what? Must be true in the church. Great leaders generally, and pastors specifically, lovingly are to, are to lay down their lives for their sheep. And that's exactly what Paul and his companions did for the believers in Thessalonica. By the way, some will argue if the church should be focusing on meeting physical needs. We know there's great physical needs in our community or in love, or whether the church should focus on preaching the gospel. I want you to think about this. That's like debating which wing of the airplane is more important. Both are essential. We are called to love people, and we love them enough, and minister to their physical needs as best we can, so that we can gain a hearing and preach and teach the gospel. And if you don't have both wings, you've got a grounded airplane that's useless. It's it's not flying. It's not doing what it was intended to do. And so we do both. We love people and we seek to meet physical needs, but we also verbally express the gospel and share the gospel. Believers must be affectionate with others. Finally, this morning, the fourth portrait that we want to study is an authentic Christian leader will be like a steadfast father. Look at verse 9. For you remember, brothers... Our labor and toil, we work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we were proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses and God also how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how like a father with his children, notice verse 12, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. As an apostle, Paul and his companions could have insisted that they be paid for or cared for, compensated while they were in Thessalonica. Traveling philosophers in those days were usually paid by their followers. So Paul was well within his boundaries, yet notice what he did. Paul modeled before these believers and this young congregation the importance of hard work. By the way, this would be an issue that Paul would address later on in the letter as well. 
This was important, especially considering the Greeks considered manual labor to be only fit for slaves. So Paul and his companions worked in order to set an example and not to be a burden for these Thessalonian believers. Some believe maybe Paul preached during the day and worked at night. We know from Acts chapter 18 that Paul himself was a tent maker. Be a believer who works with sincerity. Leaders shouldn't just make demands before followers and not be willing to roll up their sleeves and get in the trenches. Be a believer who works with sincerity. Secondly, be a believer who lives in purity, who walks a holy life. Look at verse 10 again. You are witnesses, Paul said, and God also, how holy, righteous, and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. Paul said that the Thessalonians were witnesses. They actually witnessed with their own eyes the behavior, the attitude of the Apostle Paul and his companions. But not only were they witnesses, God himself was a witness of how he and his companions sought to be holy and righteous and blameless in their conduct. And you think about it, these inner convictions led to godly outward conduct. And that's the way it always works. A lot of times we, we want to gravitate towards the outside when the heart is the key. If our heart is right, then the behavior on the outside will be right as well. But if the heart is wrong, then guess what? The outside behavior is going to be ungodly. Notice three words that Paul uses here. First, holy. Paul and his companions behaved as men who had been separated to God in his service. Second word, righteous. They always strove to do what was right according to God's law. And third word, blameless. This is really interesting. Their conduct was irreproachable before men. They lived with, without giving cause for scandal or for offense. A few years ago, there was a California driver's license, or license examiner who told about a teenager who had almost driven a perfect test. The examiner said he made his only mistake when he stopped to let me out of the car. The boy, after breathing a sigh of relief, exclaimed, I'm sure glad I don't have to drive like that all the time. <laughs> and the fact of the matter is, that's exactly how we are sometimes as followers of Christ. We put on our masks, and not the mask that you're wearing right now, but you understand what I'm saying. We put on masks on Sunday, and we live one way, and then we go to work or our place of school or wherever we go, marketplace throughout the week and we we live a totally different way our language changes our attitude changes far too many churchgoers are just like the teenager that I mentioned in that story they put on a good front when they know that someone is watching but when no one is watching they let down their standards it's been said who you are in the dark is who you really are you can fool others but you can't fool God you're not going to fool him. He knows our heart. Be a believer who walks in humility and purity before this world. Be a real deal. Don't be a fake. There's enough fakes in this world. We don't need any more. We don't need any more in the church. Be a believer who lives in purity. Then thirdly, be a believer who encourages with intensity. Look at the text, verse 12, for you, or 11. For you know how like a father with his children, notice what he says, we exhorted each one of you and we encouraged you and charged, we, charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you in his own kingdom and glory. Paul and his companions' relationship with these Thessalonian believers was like a father with his children. He was a spiritual mentor, they were spiritual mentors or fathers to them. How so? Well, we see it in at least three ways here. First, Paul exhorted or pleaded with them. The, the word there means earnest support to encourage a response or an action. Almost like coaching them, if you will. Pleading with them. Mark Twain said many years ago, I can last two months on a good compliment. So who are you exhorting? There's so much truth in that. 
Who are you encouraging? Who are you showing earnest support to encourage a response or an action? Every child, listen to me, and every church member needs encouragement. Pastors need encouragement. We all need encouragement. But Paul did not only exhort and plead with them. Notice secondly in the text, he comforted them. The word means to alleviate, to alleviate sorrow or distress, to give emotional strength to. He consoled or soothed them. How many of y'all have ever had a bad sunburn? Bad sunburn. And when you had that bad sunburn, did, did your loved one, like for me, uh, my wife will give us aloe vera gel. It's just kind of soothing, isn't it? It's soothing to a bad sunburn, soothing to the skin. How many of you have ever done this? I know I have. After having a really bad sunburn, I go and take a really hot shower. Not so soothing, is it? Totally different response and reaction. Church, listen to me. We have a world full of people who need comfort. They need help. They need to be pointed to Jesus. Let me encourage you, be aloe vera gel to them and not a hot shower. That's not what they need. They don't need someone doing anything but soothing and comforting them and pointing them to their, they need someone who will point them to their need for Christ. And so Paul comforted them, but he also charged them or entreated them or urged them to do what? Notice what the text says. Don't miss this. We exhorted each one of you, encouraged you, and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you in his own kingdom and glory. And by the way, that word walk there, it's present tense, so it means continual action. So Paul's not just saying, I want you to walk one time or maybe even just on Sunday as a follower of Christ. No, Paul's saying this ought to be the pattern of your life, that you continually walk before others in a way that is pleasing to God. We're not man pleasers, we seek to be God pleasers. So walk in a way that is worthy of Him. So what have we learned this morning, church? Authentic Christian leaders will model genuine love and commitment before the people that they have been called to lead. The key there that I want you to hear as we wrap up is this, model. Model. Model is the key. Leaders are to model, model before the sheep how to live an authentic Christian life. So four questions, four questions as we close this morning. Number one, am I a courageous messenger of the gospel? Are you? I can't answer that question for you. Only you can answer that question. Are you a courageous messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you, do you share the gospel? Do you display the gospel before a watching world with boldness? It's what Paul did before these believers in Thessalonica. So be a courageous messenger. And if you're not, then what needs to change in your life? Maybe you just need to come down and repent as we have a time of response this morning. But, but what needs to change so that you begin to become a courageous messenger? Secondly, what about a faithful steward of the gospel? Are you faithfully proclaiming, displaying, living out the gospel? Not only are you doing it with courage, but are you doing it faithfully? Thirdly, are you gentle and loving like a mother towards others in the church and in the community? The world has enough harshness. The world needs men and women who will be gentle, believers of the Lord Jesus Christ who will live in a gentle way before them, displaying the fruit of the Spirit. If you've not been gentle in your social media post or your language toward others, then that begs of you this morning to repent before the Lord and, for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Ask the Lord to help you to be more gentle toward others in how you respond. And then the fourth question, am I encouraging like a father towards my church and towards others in the community? If you're not, then that's, a, that's another opportunity for you to repent. To come before the Lord and say, Lord, help me to speak words of encouragement before others to 
to affirm others, to love others, not only to be gentle, but to show affection toward others as well. Would you stand with me this morning? I'm going to ask our musicians to come. We're just going to have a time of response this morning before the Lord. The fact of the matter, church, is this. We talk about all these areas that we are to live and all, as an authentic Christian believer, leader, and, and follower. But the fact of the matter is this, church, you can't be who you're really not. You can't be who you're really not. And so for you, if it's just a, a constant battle in those areas and other areas as a follower of Christ, maybe it is that you've never trusted Jesus in your, as your Savior and Lord and be born again. Maybe you're simply masquerading as a follower of Christ. This morning, we don't want to leave you in that hopeless state. In just a little bit, we're going to pray and we're going to sing and we've got some pastors and I'll be available. If you just want to come and say, Pastor, I, I've been living a lie in a world full of fakes. I'm, I'm a fake myself. Maybe this morning you just want to come and, and want to let one of these pastors just talk to you about how you can know Jesus as your Savior and Lord and stop masquerading as a Christian when you're really not. Really not a follower of Him. And He will meet you with grace and mercy because He is a gentle God. Maybe this morning you say, Pastor, I know Jesus is my Lord and Savior. and Man, I, I want to grow in my gentleness and my encouraging towards others. I want to be a faithful, bold messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ just like Paul modeled. And Maybe you just might want to pray up here at the front or right where you are. We invite you to respond to the Lord Jesus this morning. If you would, pray with me. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that you tell us in your word that your word will not return void. And so, Lord, I pray in this place for men and women, for boys and girls, Lord, that they would look within their hearts and see if they're simply masquerading as believers or if they're truly followers of Christ. Lord, we pray that Jesus and Jesus alone will have His will and His way during this time of response, and you and you alone will be glorified. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As we sing together this morning, we invite you just to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ.